Grace, mercy, and peace, these are the gifts that are indeed yours from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is appropriate on this day as we just had the snow fall on Friday and before it's gone by this afternoon, it's appropriate to talk about something called the snowball effect. Now maybe some of our kids in the congregation were outside yesterday playing in the snow and maybe we had snowball fights. I remember one specific snowball fight when Charlotte was younger and she made a very massive snowball and hit her father square in the nose with it. But we know how snowball effects work, right? You can take a snowball and then if you roll it in the snow, the snow continues to pack up against it and then you can make a very large snowball as it just gets bigger and bigger and then you can make a snowman with it, various parts of the snowman. That is the snowball effect. Well, the same thing is true as we see in our epistle reading today with temptation and sin. In our epistle reading, it says, God tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You see, what begins as a desire, as a thought, a sinful thought, then begins to roll and manifest itself into actual sin, and that actual sin, the longer it goes unrepented, continues to grow and grow and grow. You continue to feed it and nurture it, and then it becomes something that is very difficult to overcome. Make no mistake, it is the devil who tempts us. The same devil who tempted Jesus in the wilderness. It is the devil who tempts us to sin because he wants to bring forth death and destruction. He is not interested in your happiness, no matter if he no matter what he tells you, even though he tells you to strive for happiness, that is not the devil's concern. He's not interested in your life, though he tells you that God will not deal with your sin and that there will be no consequences for your sin. He's not even interested in your worship, though he tells you that if you worship him, he will reward you. No, the devil is only interested in your death, in your destruction. Sin, unrepented, brings forth death. And this and this only brings the devil joy. Yes, Jesus resisted those temptations. Jesus went on then to proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent of all your sins. Repent of those sins of thought those sinful desires, before they manifest themselves into actual sins, sins that seem more impossible to overcome. Because that is the sin that brings the devil joy. Sin that leads to your destruction and your death. So what brings God joy? Well, certainly a sure and certain faith that clings to his word and promises no matter what. And so to make this sure and certain faith, surer and certainer, or I guess more sure and more certain, God who does not tempt does in fact test. God does test our faith in order to make it grow, like that snowball effect. Tests, when God gives them, are like tests when we give them in the classroom. They do not give new information, but rather they affirm what we already know. 
tests of faith give us the opportunity to confess Jesus Christ even in the most difficult of circumstances. Tests of faith unite us with Christ and His suffering. And so when we talk about tests of faith, it serves us well to look at the test that Abraham underwent with his son Isaac. What did Abraham know going into that test? Well, he knows that his God is not like the other gods. His God is the only true God. His God has made a covenant with him, promising him to be the father of many nations. Abraham knows this to be true. And so the test to sacrifice your son, your only son Isaac, and this is a test to see whether Abraham truly believes God's promise, even though the path that God has put him on does not seem to make sense. And Abraham passes the test with flying colors. Abraham believes God's promise. He believes that both he and his son Isaac will return from the mountaintop. He believes that God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice. This is Abraham's confession of faith. You see, tests lead us to confess our faith, to confess Christ. Abraham confesses God will provide. Abraham doesn't know how. He doesn't know when. But he knows that God will. He will keep his promises to me, even when these promises seem slow to come or far off. How and when are questions that put God to the test. But trusting him, even when we don't know the how and the when, well, this this is the stuff of faith. Faith in what is unseen and unknown. Faith in the word that is given to us. And finally, these tests of faith, they unite us with Christ The suffering that we endure in this life, the trials, the tests that God, in fact, gives us. And remember that everything that God gives us is good and perfect. All good gifts come from heaven above. This test unites us with Christ. It unites us with his suffering and helps us more clearly to see the suffering that Christ underwent For us, when we are tested, when we face suffering in life, look at Abraham and look at how his trial, his test, pointed him to Christ. Christ, like Isaac, is the only son of his father. Christ, like Isaac, carries his own wood up the mountain. Christ, like Isaac, it seems, is the lamb who goes uncomplaining for. Isaac does ask his father, where is the lamb? But even as he is being bound to the altar, he says nothing. He goes obediently to what is almost sure and certain death. Christ goes up the Mount of Calvary to his sure and certain death. And he goes without saying a word. A lamb goes uncomplaining forth. And so what is it that gives God joy? What is it that gives us joy? When we think about the word joy, James 1, immediately before the verses that we read today, says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, when you suffer, when you are tested by the Lord, count it all joy. Well, we know that the devil receives joy in death and destruction. Then it seems obvious that the Lord our God Almighty receives joy in life and salvation. 
Romans 5 says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. For while we were still weak, Christ died for us. Yes, it is Christ's death and resurrection that gives us the greatest joy of all. And when we are united to Christ in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. To be united with Christ in his suffering should give us joy. Joy that continues to build and grow so that the joy within us and the promises of God that are given to us cannot be overcome because God has shaped them and molded them into something so big and so beautiful that even the devil himself has no power over us. These tests do come from above, and they are good. They have a snowball effect. Like temptation snowballs from desire to death, these testing snowballs, they snowball from trial to confession to hope and to life. That is everlasting life. A life that no one can overcome. Life obtained by Christ's keeping of the law, by his resisting of temptation, and by his death and resurrection. And so I close by reading to you stanza two of the hymn, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus. Let us suffer here with Jesus, and with patience bear our cross. Joy will follow all our sadness. Where he is, there is no loss. Though today we sow no laughter, we shall reap celestial joy. All discomforts that annoy shall give way to mirth hereafter. Jesus, here I share your woe. Help me there your joy to know. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.